Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cancer and Crisis Talks on Onco Daily. I'm your host today. I'm Jamal Rakelian, the CEO of the Institute of Cancer and Crisis. And today, my guest is Dr. Paul Spiegel. Hello, Dr. Spiegel. Hello. Nice to meet you. Dr. Spiegel is a Canadian physician known internationally for his expertise in responding to humanitarian emergencies, especially refugee crises. He's the director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Humanitarian Health and the professor at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Previously, Dr. Spiegel held positions as Deputy Director and Chief of Public Health at the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, as well as different roles with organizations like the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and Médecins Sans Frontières. He has published many articles on humanitarian health and migration and has served on important commissions and consortia in this very important field. Dr. Spiegel, it's our absolute honor to have you today. Can you tell us more about your background? And I think everyone is curious what led you to focus on this very challenging uh, type of research. Sure, thank you. Thank you, uh, Gemma. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm a yeah, Canadian physician epidemiologist, and I've been working in humanitarian settings for long time now, now over maybe 30 years. And by ch the reason I chose this area really is by chance when I was very young, reading uh, reading in a journal about uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, the, their creation, what they were doing and why they wanted to, why they were the need for a group like MSF. And even at that stage, I was probably about 16 or so, I decided this is what I'd like to do with my career. And so I went into medicine knowing that this is what I want to do, which I think is relatively rare. Most people just by um, fall upon this and say, oh, this is interesting, and they stumble upon a career in humanitarian health. Very interesting. Thanks a lot for your response. So, but uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, this journey was not the easy one, right? So, so tell us more about your major challenges that you faced during your career. Sure. Well, I would say when I started, there wasn't a very clear pathway. So there wasn't a center for humanitarian health or a similar center in other schools. And so this was when I was actually, I'm here right now visiting uh, in Toronto, Canada. And um, the pathway that I was told was that I need to you know, be, uh, be a physician and then get a, go into internal medicine and then go into tropical medicine. And then this yet um, that was a long, many, many, many more years of education. And what I did is after my finished medical school and a, and a year or so of residency, I then went into the field with MSF. I was lucky enough to be able to do that then. They needed less experience because it was the field was relatively new, and I went into the field working uh, with uh, South Sudanese refugees in a Kakuma refugee camp. We started that in 1992, and um, when I came back uh, to Canada to Toronto to continue my studies, it was very clear to me that this was not. You don't need a very you know an in depth clinical background, tropical medicine for this. So. Um, I ended up uh, continuing, but then I ended up leaving the residency and eventually working in the field more as a physician in, in different areas. And then I went to Hopkins to do an MPH and a preventive medicine residency. And those were the skills that I think uh, were really important beyond having some clinical skills. It was public health. It was thinking about systems and thinking about uh, communities and community involvement, which you don't traditionally get in, in a medical school environment. I see. So Dr. Spiegel, um, I want to ask uh, a bit challenging question, but I'm very curious about your opinion. So back in uh, 2017, you published a highly impact impactful paper titled The Humanitarian System is not just broke, but broken in the Lancet, right? And uh, this paper highlighted the challenges faced due to the Syrian conflict and also the Ebola epidemic at that time. So now, seven years after, do you think the world is in a better place? No. Because we had COVID recently? 
Okay. No, I don't. Yeah, uh, uh, sadly. <laughs> sadly, no. Um, and so, so I published that piece after I had spent, uh, I was working with UNHCR, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees for 15, 14 and a half years. And then I left to join uh, Johns Hopkins uh, in Baltimore. And so I published that piece because at that time, I saw there were so many challenges to a system that was not fit for purpose, the humanitarian system that was very UN international focused, that wasn't taking into account, you know, communities and national NGOs. And it was very much, it was just too, too um, focused on systems that were developed from outside various countries that were actually being affected by these communities. But since then, and of course, we couldn't predict COVID, we couldn't predict the numbers of populations that have been displaced, the, the amount of um, humanitarian emergencies that are occurring, not just in low, but in middle and even high income countries now. So the, the situation hasn't, the system, humanitarian system hasn't adapted, yet the overall context has worsened over time. So the piece that I wrote so long ago, um, I think is even more relevant now, which is why we have now developed a, a, a commission. It's called the Lancet Commission on Con uh, Health, Conflict and Forced Displacement, where we're going to be looking into this in much more detail. So um, I wanted to ask you about this later, but maybe we can elaborate a little bit on this part, because now you are co-chair of Lancet Migration and co-director of the Equal Consortium. So what are your current initiatives and projects if you can elaborate a little bit and tell us more. Sure. They vary. I think so. A lot of what we've been doing in the past while has been focusing on um, so mixtures from higher end in terms of, let's say, global global aspects of coordination and leadership and the problems with that. So we, we've done some um, examination of trying to look at large-scale outbreaks in humanitarian settings. You mentioned Ebola in DRC, but there's been cholera in Yemen, uh, cholera in Nigeria, and we've been analyzing the various systems and how responding to large-scale epidemics and responding to uh, in humanitarian settings, we have different coordination mechanisms that don't align. Um, we have the problem of because there's an insufficient capacity, we then have people moving, everyone moves towards the outbreak, and then some of the basic services that exist that need to continue in the humanitarian settings do not uh, continue, and therefore we have worsening of maternal and, and neonatal health, for example. So we work in, in those areas. Then we get even more specific into much more uh, research at the ground level. So the Equal Consortium is a, a consortium led by the International Rescue Committee, where we work in four different countries, uh, Somalia, Nigeria, DRC, and South Sudan. And there we're doing much more um, specific research on maternal and neonatal health. Um, and then finally, we another example of project we just finished was looking at uh, what is called case area targeted interventions in cholera. So it's really at the community level, looking at where cholera cases occur and then um, working with NGOs, following what they're doing to see when you have a cholera case, if you can provide um, education, safe water, better health care to, to that case and then the um, community around, will you be able to reduce cholera transmission? So it's a very big field, and we, we work on numerous different aspects, um, including, I may say, cancer and other areas that we started to work on when we noted, you know, I, I would say 20 years ago, the focus was still on infectious diseases and maternal neonatal health, maternal child health, um, but mostly in low-income countries in Africa and parts of Asia. But starting with the, with uh, the Balkans, then Kosovo, then Iraq and Syria, we needed to change how we responded in, in cancers and other, um, you know, more renal dialysis, very expensive diseases. We needed to take those into account that we had ignored previously. Yeah, thanks a lot for this uh, great work that you do. 
it, like these projects, uh, all I know how complicated they are, but also so so much needed. So uh, you mentioned about cancer, but have you ever conducted any research or initiatives that specifically address the unique uh, challenges faced by cancer patients in refugee setting? Yeah, yes, we have, but I no, not enough, of course, and I, I think much more needs to be done. But this was still when I was at um, at UNHCR, the High Commissioner for Refugees, where really with the Iraqi with the Iraq conflict and then the Syrian conflict following that, we at UNHCR needed to take into account um, people, refugees who had you know, left, left Iraq and left Syria and were going to surrounding countries, but many were already on cancer, were receiving cancer treatment. And then we needed to continue, UNHCR and then the, the hosting governments needed to continue that treatment. And then furthermore, other people who became who are were refugees eventually developed uh, cancer, and so we needed to figure out how to address um, cancer and other, you know, let's say more complicated and more expensive treatments that we hadn't dealt with at UNHCR. And this was a very this was a difficult and remains difficult from a public health point of view because you all, you have a large population that has a lot of health needs, but you have a limited budget. And so how do you, you know, in a, from a public health perspective, you want to provide the best quality care to the largest numbers of people. But, and that, that in theory could say, well, then we can't treat the very expensive cases, but that's of course not correct either. You need to be able to try to deal with both. And so we started to just record what sort of cancers there were, what sort of treatment is needed, we then needed to develop standard operating procedures. You know, for example, we needed to make very difficult decisions. If the cancer was very uh, far gone, if we knew there would be a high mortality, would we concentrate on providing treatment or would we try to help in terms of palliative care and then concentrate on those cancers that had a much better prognosis? Um, we also had, we're dealing, it was very interesting, but in the Middle East, you know, you have very, you have Lebanon, which is a privatized system with quite expensive healthcare. Um, and you had very different protocols for treating cancer than compared to Syria, than compared to Jordan and Egypt. So there was a, it was and is a tremendous amount of, um, I would say ethical, financial and public health issues that come up in, in working with cancer amongst refugees. Did you publish? Anything? Yes, we published two, at least two um, articles amongst Syrian refugees in Syrian and Iraqi refugees in Jordan and Lebanon. Um, I don't have the specific dates right now, but if you look up uh, Spiegel cancer and refugees, you'll you'll find it. So we published two. Um, perhaps not surprising, you know, breast cancer was still one of the the largest. Uh, the, the largest numbers of people uh, proportionally was breast cancer amongst women, but there were many other types of cancers. And the other aspect that came out is that in many of these countries, for the host populations, there aren't um, screening protocols, let's say consistent screening programs for a, a mammogram or cervical cancer or prostate cancer. And so we all know that, you know, it, it, addressing and doing screening will be better for the person and then better for the health system because it'll be cheaper but that's not done and so often and even cancer registries were complicated so um, how to get access to refugees for certain medications where there aren't enough medications let's say first I remember there was a very expensive uh, one component of a protocol for breast cancer and it was problematic because the numbers of refugees increase the amounts of you know the, the medicines that were available to the host to the to the citizens the nationals so these bring up a myriad of problems that you know the international community needs to address i see also i'm sure you gave some suggestions how to address these issues as well right like yes some some were for example um looking at some of the key registries and seeing how um how refugees can be included. You know, what, what happens often is at the beginning, 
people think refugees, they won't be there for a long period of time. But traditionally, unfortunately, refugees stay in a host country for a decade or more. And so um, the other aspect was to try to look at um, screening programs and see how screening programs both in the in the country, the host country, but could be also expanded to refugees as well. Another aspect is trying to look at protocols. You know, when people move, the protocols from in Syria that for for certain types of cancer treatment were quite different than in Jordan and were quite different than in in in, uh, in Lebanon, for example. So, how to understand the protocols? What does it mean when you're how to ensure continuity when you have different protocols and different medications. So there were many aspects. And then we did also, this was a very difficult, but we at UNHCR, we did develop something called the Exceptional Care Committee, which meant these were uh, diseases such as cancers, such as renal dialysis, very more expensive cancers that required hospitalization or very expensive treatments. And we had to develop protocols and criteria to be transparent of how an organization like UNHCR or and working with NGOs and other UN agencies could provide care and who we would who we could provide that care to and who we could not. And you can imagine that's being, you know, that would be very ethically uh, challenging uh, when you when you just have to choose criteria to say who can receive treatment and who cannot and for what reasons because of limited funding. Funding is always an issue, right? It's, Especially it's, it's a big issue, yeah. but not the only issue, of course. I mean, a lot of it is policy. As I mentioned, if we could do screening in all of these countries, you know, we, we try to avoid doing special programs for refugees that aren't available to national populations because that just increases um, it, it it increases these population dynamics and negative dynamics between host populations and refugees. So it wouldn't be right, I think, to increase, let's say, provide mammography for refugees and not for host populations. And so I think there's a lot that can be done that is more policy related than just finances in some sense. Is there also an issue with human resources? Definitely. I mean, hum there are human resources and uh so it's it would be human resources as well as uh, infrastructure for for cancer for i know we're not talking we're talking cancer but also let's say renal dialysis and others where you have um you're going to need you're going to need people that are professionals that are trained you're going to need a certain supply of medications that may not exist uh, tests. And so it is a problem where in many of these countries where there are refugees, there are already insufficient human resources. Um, and particularly, as we know, many of those tertiary care sort of work will be in capitals or in cities. And many refugees are just across the border into relatively remote areas. And so that's, it's not just the number of uh, people or experts to deal with this. It's also where they're located. Dr. Speaker, we talked about the uh, Lancet Commission a little bit, and I know you are involved uh, in the Lancet Commission for Migration and Health. And um, can you tell us what were the main objectives of this commission and what was the impact? Yeah, we had the Lancet Commission uh, for Health and Migration. And then we have something called um, Lancet migration, which is a follow up to that. We also now have, a, as I said, a new one, a new commission that came out in January that uh, I'm going to be, that I am chairing on Lancet Commission on Health, Conflict, and Forced Migration. So that's going to be a new commission. The Lancet migration was broader, looking at all types of migration, including economic, forced, conflict, internally displaced persons. This one is going to focus solely on conflict and, and uh, forced displacement. Um, but in all of these commissions, I think what we find is um, what we find is that there either is not enough data for in many situations, and so there isn't enough evidence at times to be able to make certain decisions. We also find consistently that there are issues with equity, and so even within 
populations. So you, you've got refugees or you've got internally displaced persons. Within those populations, they're not homogenous. You've got people who have are wealthier, people that just like in any pot, any situation in the any community where they'll have better access to health care than others. And so, you know, within these populations, we need to focus on vulnerable populations. But we also don't, we should not focus just on the status of someone like a refugee or an internally displaced people. They are within communities, right? Within host communities. And many of those host communities have many needs as well. Um, yet the way the donor community is functioning, often money goes to, for refugees or IDPs, but insufficiently to look at just everyone in an area who is vulnerable. And, and as I mentioned, that can increase the tensions between displaced populations and host populations when mostly the displaced populations are focused upon. Um, we've also, yeah, and in terms of some of the outcomes, for example, some we've had successes, some not. I think we brought the Lancet Migration and Health uh, Commission, I think, brought a lot of focus on the importance of migration, but also future thinking for the future. I mean, we, we're talking about climate change. I was just on a call on climate change and the, the amount of people, the number of people that are going to be displaced due to climate change, as we all know, is going to increase significantly. And so we need to think about and already anticipate where people may be moving to and the effects on health systems and that's going to be, you know, a large amount of people, large numbers of people moving are going to affect. They will have cancers. They will have um, other um, diseases. Yet the where they're moving to in the health systems are likely not adequately prepared. I see. So ideally, how do you see the future? Yeah. Well, ideally or, yeah, ideally versus, let's say, Let's start with the reality. So ideally, I think that it would be we that it would be a future in where where migration is accepted as a natural process, and people are going to be moving for a variety of reasons, and therefore, um, or uh, governments and organizations, whether it be UN multilateral donors, communities themselves, need to think about why people are moving and have more of an acceptance in terms of that yes these people are going to be moving of course you know we're, i'm not suggesting that everyone is going to have the option of moving to where they want to move to because there are many issues related to that but i think people we need to accept that more and more migration particularly because of climate change is going to be happening and then we need to prepare accordingly and i and i guess the reality is that we're seeing increasing populism, we're seeing increasing anti-migrant, uh, anti-refugee sentiment. And that's going to be problematic because especially when people have no choice to move, whether it be conflict or whether it be their land is no more habitable, is no longer habitable because of climate. Um, there's no choice. People are going to be moving. And so we need to prepare accordingly. So and my last question for today, Dr. Spiegel, what advice would you give to young professionals who are interested in this field and they really want to work in this particular field? I would say, firstly, it's a it is an incredibly it's an incredible field, an incredibly rewarding rewarding field to work in. Um, I would say to young professionals, work and go go with not NGOs into the field and be with the communities and the people. Don't start at headquarters or don't start with big UN agencies. Really spend time with people in the field to understand their needs, their concerns. You know, get your hand dir hands dirty. Spend a lot of time on time. And then, you know, um, then you can see where a career leads. But really get go in to, and, and go if you can, if it's feasible, different countries, different contexts to really understand a wide variety of aspects of why people are moving and their needs and the, and the systems that are going to be needed to adapt. Thanks a lot. It was a great message. And 
once again, it was an absolute pleasure having you today and wishing you all the best. Thank you, Gemma. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Anka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.